welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Challenge of the Yukon. Original air date is March 31st, 1950, and the title is 20 Little Indians. Hope you enjoy, and again, thanks for listening. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, a breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you huskies! Gold! Gold discovered in the Yukon! A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches! Back to the days of the gold rush! With Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon! It's just like Mr. Rooster says. You'll crow every morning over a bowl full of delicious Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice. Yes, sirree, it's the crisp, tempting cereal shot from guns. Just top it with milk and fruit. Take big, luscious spoonfuls. And oh boy, what a treat every time you eat Quaker popped rice. Or Quaker popped wheat. <laughs> Everyone knew there was going to be trouble from the moment Mike Donovan walked into the cafe and shouldered his way up to the bar. He glared at Carrie Braddock, who was standing at his left. The crowd faded away from them, and the noisy talk died down. Carrie didn't look at Mike. He studied the half-filled glass in front of him until the big Irishman spoke. Kitty, put your gun on the bar. Kerry turned slowly. Why should I? I'm telling you to. You'll have to give me a better reason. I haven't got a gun myself. You can see that. We got something to settle you and me. And I figured it better be with our fists. What's wrong, Mike? You went over $500 for me last night. That's right. I want my money back. No, Mike. You've won too much and too often. I'm a better poker player than you are. I've told you you should give up the game. I want my money back or I'll take it out of your hide. This gun says you won't. So you won't fight like a man, eh? But that makes you more than a cheat. You're a coward, too. Just a second. Ben Meredith, as big as Mike, his blue eyes cold as ice, stepped between the two men. You got this all wrong, Mike. You got the strength to break him in two. You're trying to force a fight this way makes you the coward. Yep. What's more, I say, Kerry, don't cheat. That makes you a liar. What are you going to do about that? I'll show you. Don't fight you. The fight was on, and it was a battle between giants. Sergeant Preston could hear the yells of the crowd as soon as he reached town, and so he drove straight to the cafe and stopped his team out in front. Looking, uh, come on, King. With the great dog by his side, he entered the cafe. It took the sergeant only a second to size up the situation. Stand aside. Let me through. He was recognized at once, and the crowd opened up for him. Big Ben and Mike were slugging it out toe-to-toe. The sergeant didn't hesitate. He grabbed each of the men by the shoulder and pulled them apart. He held the two men in an iron grip. Break it up in the name of the law. It was the authority in his voice that made them drop their arms. Now, what's this all about? He called me a coward and a liar. He called a friend of mine a cheat. Better let us fight it out, Sergeant. No. If you fight it out to a finish, I'll have to take both of you to the hospital in Dawson, and that's a long trip. Now, both of you go home and soak your heads in cold water, or I'll arrest you for disturbing the peace. Now, Sergeant... Then, get out of here. Okay. Okay, I'm going. But I guess maybe I was Never mind the explanations, Mike, outside. All right, Sergeant. Good night to you. Well, come on. The arrival of the sergeant changed the temper of the men in town completely because he had brought a sack of mail with him, and they spent the rest of the evening reading their letters and re-establishing a contact with the outside world. 
but the sergeant was worried about what he had seen when he entered the cafe. And later that night, he asked Bill Random, the owner of the hotel, for an explanation. It wasn't just Ben and Mike, Bill. All of them in there were spoiling for a fight. Would have been a free-for-all in another few minutes. Well, we've had a tough winter, Sergeant. One blizzard after another. The men haven't been able to work their claims. They've been cooped up here in town. They're getting on each other's nerves. Nothing to do but drink and play poker. Nothing to talk about but gold. I know. Those who don't have any want it, and those who do have it want more. Well, it won't be long before the breakup comes, and then we can all go back to work. I wish you could stay with us for a while, Sergeant. Why am I making a patrol? Just a few days. It might make all the difference. What are you afraid of? Well, anything can happen. Between Ben and Mike? Perhaps. They used to be good friends. What about Kerry Braddock? Well, he may not be big, but he doesn't like to be pushed around either. Uh. He doesn't cheat, I don't think. And he may shoot the next time someone accuses him of it. It's too bad we can't outlaw poker. Well, then they'd have nothing to do, and that'd be worse. No, I'm sure Carrie doesn't cheat. Now, if it were Harvey Brand... Well, if it were... He's a professional gambler. He hardly ever loses. Do you think he's in any danger of being shot? Not really. He always gives people a chance to get their money back. He'll take an IOU for any amount. Still, er... Uh... Still what? Oh, I guess I just don't like him. A fine thing when you start figuring your friends can turn into killers. I must be as jumpy as anybody else. I wish I could stay. For a week, Sergeant. I have some medical supplies I have to take to the mission across the ridge. But I'll come back this way. I'll be back in a couple of days. That'll be fine. Maybe you can cure us of this winter sickness. We sure need a doctor. The sergeant drove out of town at daybreak the following day. But although he had stopped the fight between Ben and Mike... That wasn't enough to prevent the men from taking sides. Ben and Carrie had their adherence, and Mike had his. The arguments as to who was right became more and more bitter. And that night, Harvey Brand listened to them attentively as he played poker in the cafe. When the game broke up, he walked down the street to the express office. The shutters were closed, but there was a light inside. He climbed the steps and opened the door. Johnny James, the manager, was behind the counter weighing out some dust. What do you want, Bram? Just dropped in to pay a friendly call. We missed you tonight. I, uh, had to work. Yeah, I can see you're still at it. Nearly everybody leaves their extra gold dust with you, don't they? Yeah. What of it? I got the only decent safe in town. Does that make the dust safe, Johnny? What are you driving at? You don't hold yourself responsible for it, do you? I let him put it in the safe, that's all. Yeah, I know, I know. In case of a robbery, you wouldn't have to make it good. It's a good, strong safe. Uh-huh. Whose dust you weighing out? I see the ball. Hey, give me that bag. <laughs> Carries, huh? How much is he short now? Why should he be short? You tell me, Johnny. I ought to punch you right in the nose. Sure, but you won't, because you know you can't kid me. You've been losing a lot. I got your IOU for a thousand. The night after you gave it to me, I saw you buying chips with dust. I'll pay you off. Why don't you do it now out of Carrie's dust? I'm not a thief. What do you call yourself, then? Hey, how would you like it if I passed the word to everybody that they ought to check up on you, huh? What would you do if all the miners asked for that dust at the same time? Bran, you wouldn't do that. All I want's a chance to get even. Give me a break. Sure, sure. All I want's my thousand dollars. I can't take any more from Carrie's dust. Why not? With all this trouble, you might be leaving town any day. I've got to put back what I've taken already. Why, Johnny? Because if, if I don't, I... I... How could I get away with it? <laughs> Why didn't you ask me that before, hmm? I'll tell you, Johnny. It's very simple. It was Bill Random who discovered Johnny the next morning. Bill stopped at the express office to inquire when the next sled was due from Dawson. The door was unlocked. But the office seemed to be empty. Hey. And then Bill heard someone behind the counter. He hurried around it, and there was Johnny lying on the floor, bound and gagged. When Bill had freed him... What happened? I've been here all night. What happened, Johnny? I think the safe's been cleaned out. Really? I'm not sure what he took. I'll see. I'm just about to leave. I put out the lamp and then stepped outside. Turned back to close and locked the door when somebody clamped an arm around my neck. So tight I could hardly breathe. Go on. I want to get this open. Go on. What happened? He was awful strong. I couldn't fight anywhere. I'd cut off my wind. He forced me back inside the office and over here to the safe. He made me open it. And then what? Ah, it's 
That's all I remember. He knocked me out, and when I came to, I was lying back at the counter the way you found me. He doesn't seem to have taken much. Uh, no. Company money's all here. And these are the folks the miners have left with me. They're all tagged. I've got a list. I'll check them over. By the time Johnny had checked the safe, the news of the robbery had spread through the town, and the express office was crowded. Well, what's the verdict, Johnny? What's missing? As far as I can make out, there's only one folk gone. Whose? Yours, Kerry. Oh, so that's it. Come on, Johnny, tell us who held you up. I don't know. I never saw his face. You heard him talk. Well, I didn't recognize his voice. He was big. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, that's enough. First he says I cheated him, and then he steals my poke. Mine, only mine. That's evidence enough for anybody. Where is he? Where is that thieving Irishman? You are talking about me? You know I am. Where is it? Where's my gold? You're wrong. There's something wrong about this. I won't argue. I want my gold back. I haven't got it. Then go and get it wherever you put it. Now, wait, Kerry. This is a matter for the Northwest Mountain. It's a matter between Mike and me. I let Ben fight my battle night before last, but now I'm taking over. Mike, I want that gold by noon tomorrow. If I don't get it, I'm going to shoot you on sight. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. (laughs) Say, fellas and girls, before Jake comes over here, I am going to let you in on a secret. My name's Tom Foolery, and I'm supposed to help Jay out with the sound effects today. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I'm going to play an April Fool joke on him, so listen carefully. Shh, here he comes now. Oh, Tom, are you ready for a last-minute rehearsal? Oh, boy, oh, boy, am I? Well, now, first you just stand by while I tell the fellows and girls about the biggest breakfast treat they can eat. That's Quaker Puff rice and Quaker Puff wheat. That's right. And then I tell how wonderful it is to pour out a heaping bowl full and top it with lots of milk and fruit. Mm. Hey, hey, is this where I come in? No, 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 not yet. Because I want to tell our listeners that Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice furnish extra food values of natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Mm, Yummy, good, and good for you, huh? Well, now here's where you come in. Oh, boy. It's when I tell the fellas and girls about how those premium grains of wheat and rice are loaded into huge guns. Yeah, yeah, I'm all set to go now. And then, to make them bigger and better tasting and full of bang up nut like flavor, Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice are shot from guns. <laughs> I did it! I did hey, it! Hey, what's the big idea? When I tell how Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice are exploded up to eight times normal size, that means shot from guns. You're supposed to... I know it, I know it, but I'm practicing up for April Fool's Day tomorrow. Didn't you know? My name's Tom Foolery. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good April Fool joke on me. But say, fellas and girls, here's something there's no fooling about. When you get Quaker Pop wheat or Quaker Pop rice, you won't ever be fooled if you look for the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That fine modern package has a sealed inner lining that protects the famous flavor and crispness of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice until they hit your table. That's why wheat and rice shot from guns are never sold in bags or bulk. Ask Mom to buy a package of both delicious kinds tomorrow, sure. Now to continue. Bill Ransom harnessed a dog team and started over the ridge to the mission. When he reached the valley where the mission lay, he saw a great column of smoke pouring out of the log building and tongues of flame shooting up from the roof. Out in front, the little Indian boys and girls who went to the mission school stood a short distance from Father Michel. Father, is there anything I can do to help? No, my son. There's no way to save the building now. Where's the sergeant? One of the little boys, the one I have always the most trouble with, Napoleon. He ran back inside to find a toy gun, a treasured keepsake the sergeant had called for him. The sergeant and King have gone after him. We're all praying they will both get out safely. It's been a long time now. The fire is much worse. I, I am afraid. There's no need to be afraid for King and the sergeant. Oh, uh, we... No, father. Look, coming through the smoke there. <laughs> There's the sergeant. 
And he's carrying a boy in his arms. Oui, it is true. He has found Napoleon. Heaven be praised. There he is, Father. <clears throat> Napoleon, how could you do such things? Why, I did not mean to forget the gun, Father. I mean to run back into the fire. Oh, no. No, it is all right. We found it. The fire had only scorched it a little. Oh, there's no use talking to you. We are so happy to see you. We must forgive you. Now, run along and stay close to the others. Oh, oui, mon père. I thank you, Sergeant. Napoleon's just as much a favorite with me as he is with the rest of you. Bill, what are you doing here? Well, I want you to come back to Gold Flats right away. But I can see you have your problems here. Will you stay and help? Well, of course. What are you going to do? The building's gone, but we've saved supplies and blankets. We'll build a big fire and fix up a shelter of pine boughs. That's all right for tonight, but what about tomorrow? I'll we'll have to figure that out. As Bill worked with the sergeant, he told him what had happened across the ridge. The sergeant became thoughtful, considering every angle of the case. And finally, when the children were sitting around the campfire eating their evening meal, he came to a decision. Bill, you believe that the main trouble with the men of Gold Flats is that they've had too much time on their hands? Absolutely right. Well, we're going to find work for idle hands to do. Work? The mission's gone, and there's no particular reason why it should be rebuilt here. Gold Flats would be a much better spot, and there'll be shelter for the children there while the new mission's being built. You're going to take them across the ridge? They were born in the woods. They won't find the trip too hard. We'll let them sleep until dawn, then we'll start out. Then we should be able to make the town before noon. That was a deadline Carrie set. Yes. We'll see how the men of Gold Flats act after they've adopted 20 little Indians. We'll see how much time they have for gunplay when they start building a new home for them. At noon the following day, the men of Gold Flats were expecting gunplay between Mike and Carrie. Instead, they saw a strange procession wind into town. The sergeant, Bill, Father Michelle, and 20 boys and girls. The procession headed straight for the hotel and marched inside. And by that time, the streets were crowded with men. A few minutes later, the sergeant stepped out on the porch and began to talk to them. Men, I suppose you'll wonder what this is all about. Well... The mission burned down yesterday, and these children are without a home. I'm asking you to build another one for them. That's right. I'm asking you to build a mission here in Gold Flats. There's a good spot at the mouth of the creek that isn't staked. There's plenty of lumber in the forest. Now, you've all built cabins for yourselves. How about building a home for these children? Good, I thought you'd agree to it. Where's Carrie Braddock? Right here, sir. Bill says you've had a lot of experience in building. Yeah, I was a contractor back in the States. Will you take charge? Sure. Then you can get together with Father Michelle and decide what's needed. All right, men, go to work. Are you with me, boys? Yeah. Right. I'm appointing you construction chief, Ben. Who's the best man to take charge of the lumbering crew? Well, there's only one man for that job, Kerry. It's Mike. Mike, where are you? Where's your gun? I'm giving it to the sergeant. Here, sergeant. Thanks, Kerry. Now, how about it, Mike? I'm willing to forget all about the gold until this job is done. Is it a deal? All right, why not? Will you bring the logs in? As many as you want. As you can use them. That's a promise. Pick your men and bring those logs in. From that moment on, the town seized with activity. The site for the new mission was chosen and the ground laid out. The forest rang with the sound of axes, the shouts of the lumbering crew. The thunder of giant furs crashing to the ground. The sergeant was everywhere, helping as much as he could. But although he had succeeded in his first aim, a truce in the town, he had only postponed his investigation of the express office robbery. And that evening, after most of the men had climbed into bed, dead tired from their unaccustomed exercise, he questioned Johnny James for nearly an hour. Let's see your throat, Johnny. Uh, why? You said the thief choked you. Well, there's no mark... My throat was protected by my parka. Oh. You were hit on the head, too. Yeah. You want to feel the bump? Or... No, Johnny. Did you see the thief's hand at any time? Uh, no. You should have. I'll demonstrate. Oh. Oh, wait a Take it easy now. I... I'm behind you. My arm's cutting off your wind. Your chin's pulled down to try to save your throat. You can see my hand, can't you? Yeah. Let me loose. What you're forgetting, Sergeant, is... It was dark. It was awful dark in here. How'd you manage to open the safe? I uh, did that by the sound of the clicks. Oh, I see. Well, we'll talk about that again. Oh, well, 
By the way, has anyone else been losing a lot of poker lately? Well, I haven't been losing much at all. I meant anyone else but Mike. Oh, I uh, don't know, Sergeant. Oh, I'd better find that out. In the meantime, try to remember. Any little detail may help us identify the man who held you up. Well, don't you think it was Mike who did it? The man's always innocent until he's proven guilty, Johnny. Good night, Johnny. Come on, King. <laughs> the sergeant and King returned to the hotel. The sergeant patted the dog when they reached the front door. It's too hot inside for you, King. You better sleep with the rest of the team round and back. Good night, boy. King trotted around in back of the hotel. There he burrowed deep in the snow against the cold and went to sleep. But shortly after midnight, he was awakened. Someone was coming out the back door of the hotel. King recognized who it was at once. The little boy the sergeant had carried from the burning mission. He shook off the snow and ran to the boy's side. Oh, hello, King. Oh, you must be very quiet, you and me. Her Michelle will not like it if we make a noise. But Napoleon has the greatest wish to see this new place. You come, King. There was only one light burning in the town, and that was in a cabin at the edge of the forest. Come on, King. Napoleon decided he would start his tour of investigation there, and a few minutes later, his face was pressed close to the window. This was Johnny James' cabin. Quiet, King. Harvey Brand was inside the cabin with Johnny. Napoleon could hear, even though he couldn't understand the meaning of their words. Go on, go on. I want to know everything that Sergeant asked you and everything you said to him. What about seeing the hand? Well, he showed me how I should have been able to, but I had an answer for it. That it was too dark in the office. Ah, you fool. Well, what should I have said? If it was too dark to see a hand in front of your face, how could anyone have picked out Carrie's poke from all the others? Sergeant's got you pegged. Me? What about you? I had nothing to do with it. It was your idea. You tied me up. I had nothing to do with it. You can't get away with that. I got a gun here, Johnny. Do you see it? And I'm warning you. Keep me out of this or it'll be your finish. Carrie may talk about shooting somebody, but I'm the guy who'll do it. I'll tell the sergeant everything. You can't pin it all on me. And I've got a gun, too. Put that down. No. You're in this. You'll go to jail with me. You're more guilty than I am. You... <laughs> As Johnny slumped to the floor, Harvey turned toward the window and saw little Napoleon's terror-stricken face. It disappeared almost at once. Harvey slammed out of the cabin and ran around it. Napoleon and King were just disappearing into the forest. Harvey started after them. The distant shot and the boy's scream had shattered the sergeant's light sleep. He pulled on his clothes and a moment later was running down the street toward Johnny's cabin. He was bending over the still body when Carrie, Ben, Mike, and some of the other miners entered the cabin. Is he, is he dead, Sergeant? No, but he's badly wounded. Take care of him. There are tracks leading into the forest. I'm going to follow them. All right, Sergeant. Come on, boys. The moon was bright enough for the Sergeant to make out the tracks as he ran. The boys, the dogs, and the mans. When he reached the forest, the trampled undergrowth was enough to show him the way. And he ran hard, careless of his own safety, determined to overtake the man who had shot Johnny James. Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes... And then he heard a boy's voice. No, no. The sergeant turned on more speed, calling on all his strength. A few seconds later, he burst into a small clearing cut by a gully. A man was standing at the edge of it. At the bottom, a small figure was huddled behind King, who growled his defiance. The sergeant took a flying leap and hit the man as he raised his gun. The shot went wild. Preston and Bran rolled down to the bottom of the gully. With a final and supreme effort, the sergeant twisted the gun from Brand's hand and leaped to his feet. Harvey Brand, eh? Get up. All right, all right. You're under arrest in the name of the queen. Half an hour later, a tearful and no longer venturesome Napoleon was being tucked into bed at the hotel. He, he was going to kill me, sergeant. It's all right, Napoleon. It's all over now. But, King, he stood in front of me after I fell. If the man had shot, he would have killed King. I was so afraid for him. I could not move. It's all right now. My son, I hope you have learned your lesson. Oui, mon père. One must never stumble when one runs. <laughs> one must never go roaming alone in the middle of the night. Oh, oui, mon père. And one must never scream when one sees one man shoot another man. No, no, Napoleon. That is not the lesson. One must always obey or great trouble will come to you. Is it understood? Oh, oui, mon père. Sergeant, what of the man who is going to shoot King? What will happen to him? He's on the guard downstairs. 
He'll go to jail. But not for murder. He did not kill Johnny. No, Johnny will recover. Praise God, no life has been taken. He was conscious when we got back to his cabin. He made a full confession. I, I do not quite understand what he and Brandt did. They faked the holdup, knowing that Mike would be blamed for it. And you have recovered the gold? Yes, Father, a thousand dollars worth from Harvey's cabin and the rest from Johnny's. Their false accusation might have led to even more trouble if it hadn't been for you and the children. It hadn't been for the mission burning down. God's will. Yes, Father, I think it was. It brought you here. You and the children gave the miners something to think about besides themselves. It straightened out their minds and prevented bloodshed. Now that the only real criminals in town are on their way to jail, this case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Join the crowd, fellas and girls. Hurry up and get your Sergeant Preston Yukon trail model. They're yours for the asking when you ask for delicious Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Yes, they're right on the eight different special new packages. So there's no waiting, no box tops, no coupons, no extra cost. Hurry to your grocers while there's still time. You'll want the complete set so you'll have every one of the 59 exciting, larger, easier-to-build models. They're the very places you hear about in these danger-packed adventures of Sergeant Preston and King. You get models of the Mounted Police Headquarters, a lumber camp, Wells Fargo office in Dawson City, the White Horse General Store and Jail. You get dog sleds, teams of huskies, all kinds of Yukon animals. You get a Yukon riverboat with a paddle that actually turns. Why, you've never before seen models like these. So build your complete Sergeant Preston Yukon trail from White Horse to Dawson City right away. Get them at your grocer's now. They come only on the big red and blue packages of delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Yes, the original crisp, fresh, shot-from-gun cereal that is never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the unfinished note. I was assigned to Selkirk to help solve a series of crimes known to be the work of a small gang. The only clue was an unfinished note written by the dying express clerk after he'd been shot in a robbery. I didn't think for a minute that the unfinished note would put me at the mercy of two killers who managed to get to me while I slept. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from gum. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. 
Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.